stands right now. So we'll just have to work through that. I think there's ways to do it. All right. Uh, these came specifically to the level three rule. And again, like Joy mentioned, if it's a level three rule, then ones and twos will have to live by it. I bolded the trauma program manager um, acronym up there uh, because in the level three rule, it says the trauma program manager has to go get this AIS AAAM coding stuff too within 12 months. Same comment as we had for the trauma registrar in both rules a while ago. So um, leave it at 12 for the same reasons. Somebody made the comment, obviously, from a large city uh, that said the 30-minute on-call response by surgeons, whether it be the on-call general surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon, the uh, neurosurgeon, um, is challenging in metropolitan areas. I don't, he didn't elab they, they didn't elaborate on that, uh, but I'm sure it has to do with where they live, where the traffic, uh, those kind of things. So that was his comment. So let me ask you, who wants to be on the patient on a bed Bleeding, meet trauma team activation, and have to wait 30 minutes for your doctor to be by your bedside, or greater than 30 minutes. Any takers? Raise your hand. How many want to leave it like it is? Okay. All right. And then uh, a kind of follow-up to that, the orthopedic surgeon's response within 30 minutes for life-slash-limb-threatening uh, injuries, the... Uh, they wanted the rule to read that the ED physician or the general surgeon should be able to manage those in place of the orthopedic surgeon for at least 60 minutes. I, I agree with this, but I think it needs to be rewarded. Um, I think that asking an orthopedic surgeon to respond 30 minutes, when does that happen? Very, very rarely. And I think that if it's gonna be a code, I mean, in, in my level three and other level threes that I cover, the surgeon is responsible. Now, it is his responsibility to call neuro or CT or whoever, so I don't think you should, that the orthopedic surgeon should have a 30-minute response time. The general surgeon should take care of it, get a hold of the, of the specialist, and go from there. So I don't know how you want to redo that one. Or other physicians in the room that can comment on that. I, I guess my question would be this. So if we have a patient that has a life-threatening, they should meet trauma activation criteria, right? Correct. So limb threatening in most of the trauma center criteria, that's going to catch them in the level two activation phase. So my interpretation of this is that there should be a surgeon already notified and be at the bedside anyway. Right. So I don't understand. Are you asking that the trauma surgeon is managing this patient or the trauma part surgeon is recognizing that you need ortho and calling them in? And, that, and once they activate ortho, they need to be there in 30 minutes. That's my question about this. The, the way I read it was is that from the, pay time, from the time it's recognized that the orthopedic surgeon is needed for this life limb threatening injury, um, he should be, that, that surgeon should not be held to a 30 minute response standard but more of a 60 minute. And in that 60 minutes then either the emergency medicine or general surgery should have the capability or the. And I would agree to that interpretation. So I, I guess the same thing. So if you're in the patient on the bed, need an orthopod, are you going to... No, but who are you asking, though, Jory? Are you the asking patient, the surgeon asking, or are you asking nurses? I think it should be patient-focused. What's best for that patient? So... Because, you know, we're not level ones like where you come from. We're level threes. I, I understand that. So I think it should be patient-focused. So if you're telling me that the, the, the trauma surgeon is going to take care of all those orthopedic issues... I don't have an issue with that. If your group says 60 minutes, I don't have an issue with that. But I think it needs to be, it can't be, you can't do this. It has to be what's right for the patient. Well, I know, but at the same time, we don't have the luxury that level twos and level ones have with getting orthopedic call. Some orthopedic surgeons, and we mandated this two or three years ago, that they can cover more than one hospital. So therefore, I feel very comfortable taking care of any life-threatening uh, uh, limb injuries until my orthopedic surgeon comes in. I do not want to hold that person to the same standard as I'm held to because there's short supply, just like the neurosurgeon in level two, three. I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. I'm just saying we just need to decide but 30 minutes or 60 minutes for orthopedic. 
What's confusing and what should be taken out of the scenario, as far as I'm concerned, completely, is that limb-threatening, life-threatening issue because you, that patient should meet trauma activation criteria and the trauma surgeon should be at the patient's bedside. Exactly. So when that trauma surgeon says, call the orthopedic surgeon, the que that's when we're asking the question, is the acceptable time frame 30 minutes or is the acceptable time frame 60 minutes? Because many times that patient's already been in your ED an hour. The language here as proposed is the orthopedic surgeon shall be promptly available, physically present at the patient's bedside within 30 minutes of request by the attending trauma surgeon or emergency physician from inside or outside the hospital for all patients with life or limb threatening injuries. And then the next piece is when the orthopedic surgeon is not activated initially and has been determined by the emergency physician or trauma surgeon that an urgent orthopedic consult, surgical consult as defined by the facility is necessary, maximum response time shall be 60 minutes from notification. So it is activation at the time that emergency physician or the trauma surgeon deems. Right. So I, I don't really know, I don't understand the comment. And, I, and I'm very comfortable with, with your interpretation, language, yeah. yes, with that language, because it's up to me or the ED physician taking care of that patient. Right. Because as you stated, once the code is called, I come in. So everybody in the audience have com are comfortable with this, just from consensus? Leave I'm it, very leave. visual. I need to see this or this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to leave it like Lisa read it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, the fourth bullet down, in the level four rule, when there's talking about the trauma systems committee, not the peer review, but the systems bunch, it specifically mentions in the level four rule that that committee is hospital defined, including trauma medical director, trauma program manager, additional physician representatives, departmental directors, administration, and EMS representation. And those people are, those entities are not specifically mentioned in the level three rule. So. It would probably, if we're going to have, if we're going to specifically mention them in the four, should we not specifically mention them in the three? Yes. We should. I mean, I think it's just implied if you can meet level four, then. <clears throat> and, and, and the difference is in the level four, you don't need to be a surgeon to be the trauma director. You can be the ED guy. In the level three, you have to be a, a board certified surgeon. So Correct. I think, as Jory says, it's implied, but I don't have an issue if you want to include them. The trauma medical director role in each of those are defined differently. <clears throat> yes. And then the last bullet is uh, somebody requested in the, in the PI section, um, it talks about statistical review of, uh, of your demographics and your injury scores and stuff like that. And they just wanted us to look at the language and maybe make that a little stronger as far as um, the requirement to look at that. So we'll just have to look at that, look at the language. And so the group in the audience, do you really want us to tell you what you're going to do in your committees? I mean, this is critical because we're looking at everybody's comments. I think it's important, but our job is to stay at the consensus level. Okay. Uh, still on level three, uh, somebody's mentioned that trauma team activation fee should be a desired criteria instead of essential in case a hospital opts not to charge them. So in today's healthcare environment where cost is such a big issue, why, why wouldn't we want hospitals across the board in Texas to do trauma team activations? Fees. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Is there anybody who doesn't do trauma team activations and want to explain that to us? Sheila. Our system does not do it because we've already done a carve out for trauma, so we don't add it in. We've already made the arrangements prior to, so we don't, it's a, that's the way that our system has chosen to do it. Are you a level four? I'm a level one. It's the same way we've chosen to handle it, we don't charge on it. So what if we added our, have a managed care carve out thing? I, I guess what most people wanted to see this, why they wanted to see this criteria in there is because they want to see hospitals foster reimbursement, whatever you can do in your hospital or to decrease cost, whether it's recoup some of it through trauma activations, and you don't get paid for all those activations anyway, I'll be the first to tell you, or create that carve out. So any discussion from the committee? 
Well, actually, the proposed language says establish a process to utilize UB94 or managed care carve out for trauma charges. So, I mean, that would. So, Root labor is this, okay. As AE? Okay. And, okay. And then uh, in the level three document, the, the criteria talking about having your transfers out in two hours, that box is blank. I'm assuming that needs to be an E, right? I, you know, for, for the, I mean, the ones we transfer the most are burns and they go to BAMC here in San Antonio and sometimes it's upon the availability of the air ambulances. Not so every time as a trauma director, I have to document why it took eight hours, nine hours. I don't think it should be essential. I think it should be desired because we already have a rule, ER to OR, ER to ICU, two hours. And anything above that, you gotta document why. The majority of the reasons is better availability. And I can tell you on reviewing a lot of the data that I do, uh, the, tr the, the transfers, four, five, nine hours sometimes has nothing to do with us or the accepting uh, hospital it has to do with a transport issue. But from a systems perspective, that's an important piece of data to continue to track. And just to have an overview to know that your problem really is with availability of, of transport. So I, I hate to take that out as a requirement, not that it, everybody's gonna just fail because they can't get all their transfers out, but because they need to know why and they need to, we need to know that they're looking at that right, to ensure that there's no reason that is controllable. But that's why I would keep it desired and not essential. There's a big different distinction between those two. I, th I think the original intent and what was stated was that the transfer will be initiated within two hours. And the question that people are asking is, is it two hours from the patient hits the door or two hours after you've identified the need or injury See, for And treatment? the way I take it is two hours to get the patient out of your facility when they hit the door. So if you're gonna make it like that, I don't have an issue. It's just, if you're gonna make a decision, transfer within two hours of it hitting, a patient hitting the door, that's fine. I'm talking about from the time that you make the initial contact to the patient actually physically leaves your hospital. Right. And that's the difference. I, th I think the, there's another comment about this in here somewhere, and Sally, I know you've brought this up before. The question is, I think everybody agrees that when you say this patient needs to go, they need to go in two hours. In some hospitals, the answer is from the time they hit the door to the time that they leave is two hours. That's the goal, that's what we wanted. And then Sally made us aware that in some of these cases, you don't know that they need to be transferred till you've done your evaluation. So the real debate, as far as I'm concerned, the debate should be this. Should the two hours to transfer be when they hit the door? Because there will be some. If you are a spinal cord injury 10-year-old, most hospitals, when they hear that patient's coming in, know that they're not going to keep that patient. So that patient should be very applicable to be moved in two hours. The other patient is one that comes in and after you've done the procedures or the CT scan, you recognize, oh my gosh, there's a subdural, we need to transfer. And the goal is, is to have that transfer initiated and out in two hours. That's what all this, this is how it started. So you can see why there's different perspectives on that, but that was the original intent of this particular issue. So the question is, how do we get the wording? And one of you that's got the documents, look at the wording and tell us exactly what it says. Because obviously, two or three people commented on this. Dr. Uh, Lopez has some, do you have language you'd like to offer on that? I can tell you that it's for the level four, so that we, have a, we deal with a lot of level fours down in South Texas that are trying to transfer patients out. And two hours, you're, you're, it's wishful thinking, it's not gonna happen. And even with us, even though we have a lot of capabilities, there are certain patients that we have to transfer out. And it, does, it takes, on the average, I would say three and a half to four hours. So keeping us to that standard as an essential criteria, I would venture to guess 90% of all hospitals will fail that are in rural areas. So I guess my question is how could we, what would we have to put in place to, to make it work 
to get them faster? I mean, I know that there's a distance location. Is it do ho well, helicopters that need to be strategically placed differently? Is it just the flying distance? I mean, I, I can tell you that I'll just pick one hospital at Star County. They're a level four. Those who start calling McAllen, uh, Harlingen, Roundsville, San Antonio, and a lot of it has to do with having availability at those institutions and then having them flown to our areas. So it, it's, it's multifactorial. It's not just helicopters and right. where, you, you, where you put them. Jory, um, the actual criteria reads, as it's proposed, is disposition decisions shall be made expeditiously by a physician at the hospital and preparations for transfer are begun as soon as possible after arrival at the facility not to exceed two hours. So I think the criteria is talking about the decision. See, to me that doesn't sound you have to get the patient out of there within right. two hours because that's where I have the issue. That's not what it says. It, it says make the decision. So that, to me, I would keep it the same. Okay. I, no, that's a better, uh, I mean, the so, way it's written is the same. So that's Perfect. the criteria. The yeah. standard that well, we talked about was if transfer is needed, transfer is completed okay. within two hours of arrival. So if you had that case in Star County, they're held to the standard, so it would fall out in their PI review such that they would have to look at it and say, why did this bust the two-hour? And it's either justified or it's Yeah, but anybody here from Star County? Never happens. I can tell you. It never, ever happens. I would venture to guess four to six hours on the average. It does not happen. And that you will always fall out. Okay, so we're going to leave it as it is, right? The way, the way it's read, I... I would keep that language. Would you agree? Okay. And then the last empty box, go back one, is the criteria that says that administrative representative needs to attend 50% of the systems committee meetings. It doesn't have an E. It doesn't have a D. I would put an E. Okay. E. E. Everybody think E? Okay. Next. <laughs> we'll be through pretty quick. I just uh, want to remind everybody the posters have to be picked up at 5. So anybody in the audience has got a poster out there, it needs to be picked up. For level fours, uh, what administrative education qualifies? That's just a question. Uh, the trauma records being submitted within 90 days. We talked about that a little bit ago. Uh, there's a statement in the level four criteria or the rule that says that's talking about the board certified ER physician being our, that's a desired criteria that their ER docs be board certified. And the consensus at TTCF yesterday was that um, most level fours, particularly rural level fours, don't even have board certified ER docs, and so it's probably wasted ink. Um, so th their recommendation was to just delete the whole criteria, since it is a desired in the proposed rule. Uh, this was a typo in the proposed rule. Telerad turnaround times originally said should be greater than 60 minutes with 80% compliance. That obviously needs to be less than 60. And then the last bullet, uh, in the administration, you know, the administration criterion's all new proposed language. In the current rules, there's nothing that talks about administrative commitment and actions and stuff. Somebody made the comment that all of those should be initially listed as desired criteria. And then at some point in time, as administrators and admission administrations get used to the responsibilities that are being placed on them, are measured upon them as part of their designation uh, be made into essential criteria at a later date. That was the comment. Okay, so people in the audience, your, your, your boss, your administrator, do you want them to know what you're responsible to do, yes or no? Okay, so raise your hand if you think they should be held accountable to have some type of training about the trauma center. Raise your hand. So that means it would be an E. So if you want it to be an E, raise your hands. You think it should be an E? If you think it should be a D, raise your hands. The E's got it. The, the, other, the other pieces of the administrative grouping is charging, charging or doing the managed care carve out, establish a process to develop a budget line for trauma, establish a process to demonstrate that uncompensated care reimbursement to the facility through the driver's responsibility program is sustaining, enhancing, and improving the trauma system, and then administration attending 50% of the committee meetings. 
Those are the pieces of that group, new group. So to those of you who raised your hand that said you feel like this is essential, do you feel like all those elements are essential for you to be successful? Raise your hands. So now <coughs> there were bunches of hands. Now we see four or five hands. Can you read that list again, please? This is for um, the level fours. Okay, that's where we're at. So um, evidence of participation in trauma center ed education, specifically targeting the administrator, ch chief executive officer. Hold on. Er raise your hand if you think that's essential. Okay. Establish a process to utilize UB94 managed care carve out for trauma. Charges. Raise your hands if you think that's essential. Okay. Establish a process to develop a budget line for trauma. That got more ease, okay. Establish a process to demonstrate that uh, the uncompensated care reimbursement to the facility through the driver's responsibility program is sustaining, enhancing, and improving the trauma system. Raise your hands. As opposed to going into general coffers is the way I would read that. And then the last one is administration attends 50% of the committee meetings annually. So for those of you that are out there, almost all of those, there was a majority that raised their hands. So those of you who did not raise your hands, can you give us some, what, what, what are your thoughts to help us balance this out? We want to make sure you have equal time. Anybody? Anybody that wants it to stay desired, can, anybody want to comment? Anybody on the committee that thinks it should be a desirable, wants to comment? I think if we're going to jump in, let's jump in the deep end. Okay. And then I'm going to go through these real quick in the interest of time. But I think, you know, what his, has historically happened in these rule revisions is there's been a sideline document called a essential criteria defined document that kind of explains what these rules mean. And I think a lot of these comments and predomin these are predominantly questions that were sent. Um, which patients would fall under the two-hour transfer rule? So we when, just clarified that, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when does the two-hour transfer rule begin? When the decision's made, when they hit the door? Da, da, da. So How it's we in the criteria. Is everybody comfortable that that's defined in the rules? Yes. yes. Right? Okay. How are we going? Standard. standard says two hours of arrival. The standard So we'll have to fix the standard. Uh, how are we going to demonstrate concurrent review? How will the events, i.e. the variances that are identified, uh, be measured? Well, we can work through that. It's kind of like... That's your plain old PI process. Yeah, doing it now. Which patients need anticoagulation screening? Do they all need it? So select ones. And then specific to level four, who's responsible for supporting the physician CME, i.e. the ER doctor, the, the, specifically the ER physician? Is it the hospital's responsibility, the... ED physician um, staffing agency or whatever. Comments we made at TTCF yesterday is really doesn't matter, just who pays for it and just that they get the required hours. And then somebody asked the question about what level, what is the allowable level for mid-level to manage the care of the patient from the time they hit the door? And I'm, I'm assuming that's gonna be hospital defined. That has to be written. You have to have a physician, first of all, that says that these are the protocols I mean, there's a lot of things tied back to uh, CMS. Trust me, I know this. CMS and <coughs> Joint Commission regarding that. that is, that's a hospital specific. And the rules and the criteria, I know that on several occasions people have asked, can the PA or the trauma mid-level be the first responder to the trauma resuscitation? And so that's something that your hospital has to address based on the CMS and the um, Joint Commission criteria. Okay. Well, you know, the ACS defines that already for us. Right. We're very clear. <laughs> and the answer is? They do not, the surgeon yeah. does. Or the, yeah. Right. <coughs> Other questions? Go back one, maybe. 
Uh, another question was, is uh, the, the criteria says that the trauma program manager and the trauma medical director need to be at all trauma peer review meetings. This came obviously from a small town hospital that probably outsources all their peer review to like that Archie group that um, will send them back a, you know, a comprehensive peer review report on the case. So um, it was a question they had. Could, I think they'd have to apply for an exception to a waiver to the rule for that then. That in my comment yesterday at TTCF was is once the hospital receives that peer review back from that agency, surely they talk about it at some medical staff level, what the findings of the agency were. And well, don't they have to have a degree of peer review to even decide to send it for an expert's right. review? There are facilities that have one doctor for the, and that's it, and they, they may use locums to cover. And so for that facility, their only choice is to send everything out for to uh, outsource peer review. How can a one doc hospital be a but I, I think that's a very small part of our hospital, so I think they would have to apply for a waiver specific to that. We can't write rules. The rules should fit the majority of what we are capable of. Uh, can systems committee structure be individually defined by the hospital instead of using the rule? That's that composition like I read off a minute ago. Uh, several people made this comment that we need to better define what is a major trauma patient and what is a severe trauma patient. Uh, currently we use injury severity scoring. Um, and then somebody else asked, can the hospital have its own definition of what a major and severe patient are? So again, I think when we get to that criteria defined document, we can talk more about that. Non-boarded, there's some layout stuff that needs to be fixed. There's some language in there that in the trauma medical director section that's talking about the non-boarded general surgeon just participating in the trauma program and their CE requirements and all that stuff. So that just needs to be cleaned up. And then somebody asked, the 16 hours of continuing medical education for the medical director, does that, can, does that only have to be type one CME or can it be type one, type two? That was their question. Any thoughts on that? What, do we know type one, type two? Do you know what those are? I'm not an expert on it. Uh, type one is a didactic or yeah, objective. Yeah, it's a CME, and then type two is something that you can read a journal or something like right. that. But I, I, uh, I personally think that it should keep type one. Someone had a comment. I don't think the rule specifically mentions which type right it now. Doesn't, so. It doesn't say, yeah. but we take it as, uh, as a type one, yeah. So where are other physicians in the room? Dr. Smith, do you think it should stay type one? Maybe not at a level four, where the guy's going to have a hard time getting away. But any of the other institutions, it probably should be type one, at least outside the institution. Okay. Dr. Moore? Especially if somebody else is funding it, right? <laughs> Any other physicians in the room that I can't see? Want to comment on that? So the recommendation was to evaluate it for the level fours, and I, I don't. Our rules do not talk about type one, type two. It just says CME, right? Yeah. I personally so, think we shouldn't define it. I don't think we should. I, I think we can leave it and and because there are some that they can participate in education and may not get credit for it, but it's an appropriate participation and, you know. I, the Green Books talks about within your institution or outside your institution. And right. That would probably be better to follow because what you really want is 16 out of your institution. I can get 50 in my own institution right. in any given year. Okay. Any other comments on this particular slide? There's a lot of controversy here. I do, I do have one comment that we kind of passed. It. The first one, I'm going to go back to that. I think the language was to kind of protect the trauma program manager because there were instances where the trauma program manager was, was not privy to the peer review and, and somebody kept it locked up in some administration and they weren't able to get any of that feedback and therefore they couldn't close any of those loops. And so the intent was to ensure that the trauma program manager was privy to what occurred in the trauma peer review. And so that, that the language was to protect th that. So the audience, number one, the audience, if you want to leave the language as it is where the trauma medical director and the trauma program manager need to be there, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Yeah. Scott, you want to read it? What the current language says? Uh, 
Um, it's two or three sentences in the, in the, the, the specific uh, criteria, but the last sentence says the trauma program manager and the trauma medical director must be present at all trauma-related peer reviews. Now, the question is, how many of you think that should remain, the language should remain as it is? Raise your hands. How many think it should be changed? Nobody said it should be changed. Okay. Right. We're close to being through. Sorry, it's taking so much time. All right, uh, another quick, this is the last slide on questions and clarifications. Who is senior administration? This person asked, specifically asked, would the director of quality at that hospital be considered a senior administrative person that they report to? Uh, define TPN. Uh, trauma program trauma manager. Trauma program manager, the trauma coordinator. Oh, uh, the trauma coordinator. Well, here, here's the answer to that. The person who gives you your evaluation. So then we have two different reporting because in my trauma uh, contract, I have to report to the CEO. Uh -huh. So then the trauma coordinator is going to, okay. The tr most trauma program managers have a person who makes sure they get a check and gives them their evaluation. That's the person that's being targeted here. So how many of you in the audience have an issue with that? Have an issue with, huh? Have an issue with who they report to? No, with that criteria or, or the question. I don't understand what they're the, really the, wanting the, there. The question is, is who is senior administration? Oh. Is it the just, CNO or just the O's, well, just guy. the executive <laughs> administration? Or that's, is it like to say the director of quality at this his hospital um, is definitely not an executive administrator at the, at the hospital. So is that appropriate? Is, would they count as senior administration? I think that's a loaded question. Because if you ask me who needs to be at the trauma executive or your trauma systems committee, obviously the person over quality would be a great person to be there. But all this stuff about the administrator is really targeting the person that you report to in the trauma program who helps you build your budget, helps you get your resources, as well as the COO and CEO. So I, I don't know how to put all that stuff in language and make it work. I think this really is about authority for the trauma program manager and in the who you report to really allows you to for the trauma program manager to have the authority to who you interface with so you have to be at some level where you can interface with um, manager levels in radiology laboratory ICU and I think that was the intent that the the trauma program manager is not reporting to a manager and and then the manager is supposed to to interface with the rest there has to be enough authority where there's direct interface and so I don't know how you write that in language but I think that's where the intent was to ensure that the program manager has that authority I, I thought we wrote that look at the trauma program managers section that we put in there I thought we addressed that by having the authority to cross all boundaries and the authority to make recommendations for treatment options in all clinical areas that take care of the trauma patient and says, be structured says has the authority and responsibility to monitor trauma patient care from ed admission through operative intervention icu care stabilization rehabilitation care and discharge including the trauma pi program the trauma registry injury prevention and outreach education that doesn't address that So that's two different things we're talking about. So the question, to go back to Lisa's question, state your state so everybody can understand what you're saying. And just, but Lisa, while you're thinking, just to clarify, this particular criterion is only in the level three rule. It's not in the four. Okay. About the reporting but to even senior administration. It is in the three. Right, but even in the three, the, the point is to ensure that. You have to speak in your mic so oh, they can hear. Sorry. 
The point is to ensure that the trauma program manager has appropriate authority. And so you can write it into the rule that their job description is that they have the ability to cross all of these lines, but they have to ensure that they have the organizational authority to cross those lines. And so I think, honestly, I think that depends upon the, the structure of the organization. I personally report to the quality officer, but she's a no. It, that's the way the structure is. Um, but I also have the authority to cross those lines. So, so I'm not sure that we can uh, define that. The, the point is that there's enough senior level reporting structure so that there can be peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication. The, the problem happens when uh, the trauma program manager reports to the ER manager. And you all know that happens. You know, that, that's three. what we're trying to prevent here because then there's not that level of authority. You don't have that ability to cross those lines. Why don't we say they have to report to senior management? Yeah, the reality is at this point, I don't think we can tell hospitals how to organize their structure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's, that's my so that's the reason why we're trying to say that the trauma program manager needs to have the level of authority and accountability to make recommendations and changes in the trauma system at all levels. Now, you could put a statement in there that they must have an organizational title equal to the managers and the individuals responsible for the ER, the OR, the ICU, and so on and so on. We could add that statement if, if that needs to be stated. But the other issue is, you know, what you're, the other group was after, how do you get that administrative officer at your trauma executive committee that gets you the resources yeah. that you need? So for me, that has to be somebody from the C-suite office. But it's hard to say who that should be, chief nursing officer or over the chief operating officer. Yeah, one of those first things we talked about. But, but part of that's because some hospital call them all executives and some people call them all seniors and some people don't even call them that. So some won't tell you what they call them. But the bottom line is that has to be, that's what we're after. How do we get the terminology that's appropriate that's going to meet all hospitals? Right? That, that was where I was going for, whoever the, whoever in that office, <coughs> chief executive officer, chief operating officer, chief nursing officer that the trauma program reports to, that's the person we're targeting. So, it, and it may be in the level four hospitals, reality may be that the trauma program manager reports to the ED who reports to this person. That's still the person that we're after. Do you all agree? Yes. So we got to figure out the language for it. So let's work on that offline, okay? Well, at a minimum, I, th I agree with Sally. I think we, we need to keep the language consistent. If we're going to use executive in one spot, let's use executive. It doesn't okay. make that big a difference. Uh, this is an easy one, I think, to find what, who the core attending general surgeons are. I think the ACS does a good job of doing that, so we can just kind of copy that. I actually got a definition for that. I looked it up. If you're interested, I'll read it to you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and then the education for the ICU you nurses read. came up again. Can in-house education work? Do they have to get pediatric certified? Um, you know, we talked about the discussion we had this time a quarter ago about it. That's only targeting to the ICU nurses that routinely go to the ER um, and participate in trauma resuscitation. So, and then, um, and again, that can be spelled out in a criteria, in a defined document. And then do PI inclusion criteria equal registry inclusion criteria? Obviously, I think we all think would agree the answer is no, but it probably just needs to be spelled out in a criteria defined document. The definition, this is from the American College of Surgeons, the definition of the core trauma surgeons is this. The core trauma surgeons are designated by the trauma medical director and trauma program. They are the, um, they make up the majority of the trauma panel and cover 60% of the call. And they're the ones that are, have the responsibility for attendance at your peer review and your operations meeting at least 50% of the time. Any questions on that? 
Scott, Lisa, anything else from this slide? No. This pretty much looks redundant. Yeah, these are just some of the, um, I think we kind of crossed wires and got some of the comments that I'd emailed you. Um, okay, I'm gonna summarize this. For the standards, there was two pages worth of standards. I only got two comments. Um, and Lisa, only, between me and Lisa, we got two comments. One of them was dealt with that registry abstraction entry, number of days, 45, 60, or 90. We've talked about that already. And then um, the other recommendation for the standards was on one of them, it talks about the need for staff education and they recommended using caregiver education because it may be interpreted that traveling nurses, agency nurses are not necessarily hospital staff, but if they're gonna be functioning and filling a role, they need that education also. So they want to use the word caregivers instead of staff. They have to be a member of your staff, even if they're travelers, aren't they? Correct. If they're a, if they're a traveler, they're contract nurse, they are your staff. Okay, clears that up. And then under events, we only got one comment or recommendation, and it dealt with that registry abstract entry thing. Same, same thing, so the number of days. Okay. That's all I got. Any comments from the audience on this? We want you to feel like you have equal opportunity to comment. Okay, so this is Dr. Daniels' uh, feedback to the committee last time and he presented it. We did not vote on it, so it will be an action item. And it's his definition of, and, and again, the American College of Surgeons has criteria if you're not board certified, what is the alternate? And so this is the alternate language that he would like to recommend. We did talk about it. Everybody was comfortable with it, but we did not, in the minutes, it's reflected that we did not vote on it. So, Dr. Smith, you worked with him on it. You want to walk us through this, or? Well, most of this actually comes straight out of the green book. It's not all that tough. You had a, oh, surely you're not saying you can't hear me, right? Does this work? Most of this comes straight out of the green book. And to set a different standard would be not the right thing to do. And it's all of these are defined in the green book, where, where you're, you can have members of the team that are not board certified, but they have to meet the criteria that's in the green book. And that is very clearly defined. Well, this is a little bit different from the green book because the green book, our ortho liaison is one person. Our neuro li liaison is one person. And what this is saying is that should ideally be one in the setting where it's not possible that they're recommending that you can have an alternate in that role and the liaisons are responsible to take the information that comes from the peer review and the operations committee and disseminate, disseminate it to the other orthopedic surgeons that take call or the other trauma surgeons or the other neurosurgeons. And so what this is saying is you can have more than one, but they have to meet the same criteria that, all, that the liaisons are held accountable for. Right? Yes. So we'll bring that back as an action item. So then this is the question, again, the core, the trauma panel we just talked about in the core surgeons. Um, so you got the definition of the core surgeons, I just read it. And then there was a question that came up that was forwarded to me about trauma-related CME. So we say all then through there, you have to have trauma CME. So the question is, well, what is trauma CME? What makes up, what it would be accountable for that? So I took a stab at identifying it, and it's all trauma injuries. So start at the head and go to the toes anything related to an injury uh, obviously is going to meet that criteria in all ages anything that has to do with shock management anything that has to do with airway management anything with disaster or system management should all be included in trauma cme so the question is do you feel like this needs to be written into the language or just leave, it just currently says uh, trauma-related CME. I would say no. When you go to the American College of Surgeons uh, page and you go to the CME, it tells you this is trauma, this is non-trauma. I don't think you need to be that specific to the trauma surgeon uh, who's uh, going to be held accountable to do the trauma CMEs because it's already defined by the ACS. The, the problem is is that if the surgeon doesn't go to the ACS where they've done that, and let's say they go to a conference in California, then somebody's got to take that syllabus or that 
schedule and say trauma, 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 not trauma, 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 not trauma. So the trauma program managers, I've gotten three phone calls are stuck because they're trying to decide that. And in two occasions, they were actually having their site survey and the surveyor was saying that's not trauma. And so they're wanting guidelines. I like to leave things open, but the question is, you know, we could say to include these topics, but doesn't exclude others or something like that to give people. Yeah, but, but you can't make up the rules though, Jory, because if you go to a conference in Alaska, it's going to tell you in the syllabus, uh, this is 16 CMEs of which four are trauma. If it doesn't say that, then it's not trauma. I'll give you an example, like orthopedics. I can tell you, I don't know if Ronnie would, would agree or disagree, when orthopedic surgeons go to CME, guess what? They're all going to be trauma. Right. But for, for the general surgeons, <coughs> it's a little different because when you go to conferences, especially if they're sponsored by the ACS, they're going to be designated. I, I understand for those that are not uh, sponsored by the ACS may not be broken down, but I would venture to guess that they're probably not trauma. I want to make it clear, Jory Klein is leave, happy leaving it just like it is, but I see trauma coordinators, especially in the level three, who are struggling trying to answer this question. Is so, it an opportunity just to offer guidance and not write it into the rule? I think we're getting into the weeds. And I think there's opportunity perhaps to offer guidance and suggestion, but to write it in the rule is really pretty narrow. I don't think it, you know how you have those little statements underneath the rule? That's the only thing we're talking about. So leave it as it is. Does anybody in the audience want to comment on it? <coughs> Thoughts? I don't think it's a bad idea to say, may include but not limited. Right. That's what I was recommending. Okay. Let's so talk about are the... are we going to do it then? Is that the plan? If we do it, it'll only be in that caveat that may include but not limited. So I personally just want to leave it alone. So here's the, and again, we're going to send these to the state. The state makes that decision, right, Jane? This is ultimately your decision. Thanks. Let's talk about the trauma registry. <laughs> is there anything else about the trauma rules that anybody wants to bring up? The trauma center criteria rules, going once, going twice. Anything else anybody wants to bring up? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the trauma registry. So we have talked about trauma registry validation on this committee numerous times, and we have tighter language, we believe, in the rules for the uh, validation. So yesterday in the tra Texas Trauma Court, on uh, the TTAF meeting, and in the Texas Trauma Coordinators Forum, there were some issues brought up with the registry, pretty significant issues. And so instead of going through this and time, I want to ask, um, Tammy and Lisa and Scott to comment on potential solutions uh, on building consensus for this registry. So which of you wants to start? Well, uh, as a standing agenda item for probably what the last 12, 18 months, uh, we've asked uh, the DISHES registry group to uh, come give an update to the Texas Trauma Coordinators. And that happened yesterday. And a couple of things. Um, kind of raised eyebrows, I guess, and that created quite a bit of discussion. And one was the required reporting of first and last names. And if those, if those fields weren't submitted with the, doc, with the, with the uh, file, with the document or the, the, pay, the event, then uh, it would be rejected. <coughs> so um, there was quite a bit of discussion on that. There was also some kind of some sidebar discussion that came off of that on that some of the representatives of the um, registry solution work group were uh, kind of surprised that that was going to be a requirement and, and kind of felt like they had been, uh, I don't know if circumvented is the right word or, um, or what. So those were a couple of things that came out. Also, um, in the wake of the reporting the names and stuff, well, then it came up that people that use pri uh, third party vendors <clears throat> Some of them may already have those fields and aren't submitting them. Some, some, some agencies are going to have to build those fields. It's going to take quite some time. 
Uh, other comments that came up were, why are we turning the old registry off today and, and not testing the new registry for a, 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 an ample amount of time before, um, like I say, before we turn the old one off? Um, what other issues, Lisa? The legacy data, the ability to upload the legacy data. Um, there was concern that, that, I'm sorry, there was concern that the, the legacy data uh, would not be able to be submitted, um, and I think it's related to the name issue as well. I think that that's about sums up the issues. Anyway, in, in a proactive stance, a, a, a group of um, TTCF representatives, TTAF representatives, Trauma Systems Committee representatives met with the registry today to try to um, discuss some of this stuff and um, get some answers, uh, some rationalizations, and so forth. And to be honest with you, the issues that were brought up, um, DISH has had very legitimate responses on explanations, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it made sense. And um, there were some recommendations that would for this group to consider in that um, the current trauma registry solutions work group, uh, according to the DISHES staff, has kind of, was pretty robust initially, but has kind of waned as far as membership and participation. So um, the people that were in that room made an individual commitment to um, participate in that work group and or uh, spur on the people that we've assigned to that work group to re-engage, if you will. Um, another thing we talked about was initially when this whole registry started, there was a steering committee developed that included several um, key players, Dr. Stewart, Eric Epley, um, I don't remember all of them, but uh, when the registry solutions work group was developed, it was it's like that steering committee was turned off. So we want to reestablish that steering committee or a steering committee um, that keeps a um, perpetual pulse on the development of the registry and gets um, timely and productive reports on the registry development. Lisa? And I think there was some good effort made and better understanding, at least on our part, that the registry folks will work um, to, to look at solutions with uploading that legacy data so that folks can do that and also to have user testing that will ensure that all the different vendors will be tested. So we, we felt pretty comfortable that there is some, some some um, better communication. There's a lot of things we didn't understand and I think we were able to explain our concerns a lot better. So we felt like there there's some efforts made so that we can bridge those concerns. And the forward. testing of the new system behind the scenes, it was explained to us, has been occurring in that the mm -hmm. DISHES staff has been taking files from the old registry for the last two or three months and feeding them into the new system to work out the bugs the glitches, making sure the mapping's all right and stuff like that, so they feel comfortable. And where they are now is to this pilot testing. I don't can't remember the terminology for the, that first two or three months, but the, the, where they're doing that, this point forward is pilot testing, and that's where they've gotten 50-something hospitals, 20-something EMS providers to actually submit the data so that it can be real-time practiced and trialed uh, between now and what was the date, September 10th or 6th or something like that. <clears throat> so that's the trial of it, try to work out the glitches in the new system. There was some concern about agencies that are just kind of put on hold because the old system's not up, the new system's not live yet for the most part, and um, a backlog of registry stuff. So the registry staff and um, the trauma EMS um, division staff talked about how they would work with facilities on backlogs of registries that if that does occur, um, that it wouldn't be just a, you know, slap, slap in the face. They, they would be understanding that the challenges through the tra transition. Let me ask Wanda, you were in the room. Do you have anything you want to add?
and the, and the counterpart to that explanation was by the group that was there was um, based on the history of trials and tribulations of the Texas EMS and trauma registry. That is what that is what has established the insecurity in our hearts that if we send those names in, is it truly protected? So that was a discussion that was had. So and and, it, and again, like Wanda said, it was assured that those systems are in place at the state level to protect that data. And if, I mean, nothing's for sure, but if we do what we're supposed to do and it does leak out through the state, then it's on them. It's not, it's not liability on us as the hospital because we did what we were supposed to do, so. Jackie, you were there, any comments? Dr. Stewart? I don't really have anything else significant to add. I think uh, uh, all the questions were addressed. I think the, uh, the registry work group and the state have, uh, you know, have uh, worked hard to, to get the registry off the ground. I, I think it is just about to be off the ground, and so I think, I think it's appropriate to uh, put together a group of people and make some extra effort to try to work through the details with respect to implementation of it, which is really, that's where we are now. So, so uh, I felt good about that. I think the, uh, the, the, the DSHS staff echoed that uh, in this new implementation that uh, they're going to continue to do what uh, they've done in the past is help people through, make certain there's no, people aren't being held accountable to an unreasonable standard when, if it's a problem with respect to getting the new system up and running, there will be a lot of flexibility with respect to that. So I, I've, I felt uh, uh, good about all those things. Tammy, would you like to say anything? Thank you all for having the meeting today so that we could get some clarification on some of the issues uh, because sometimes when information is new people jump to conclusions and it makes it harder to discuss um, what the facts are so i think we made a lot of uh, progress today in understanding exactly what we have been doing and where we're at and i think there were very good um, suggestions about the registry solution work group uh, changes to it so that it can continue uh, to function and, and to assist us with building the new system. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling very positive about moving forward. Okay. Just so everybody knows, after the meeting last night, obviously there were some very, um, let's just say, ill feelings. So I asked Jane and then spoke, asked Jane if she would speak with Tammy to see if we could get a small work group to talk about some of the things that came out last night so that when we came today to this meeting we would have more solutions and not another um, frank discussion of what we think is not going to work. So one of the things that I asked Jane and I asked Tammy to do and their support to do this is that the registry work group solution, the people that have been on that have done a very good job. So I don't want anybody to think that that group is not doing something for us. They've done a very good job. At the same time, there's still a lot of questions. And so we've asked at the GTAC meetings, we're all here, right? Is if some of those meetings can occur here so that anybody that wants to participate and wants to hear or wants to have a voice can do so and not have the burden of another trip to Austin. In addition to that, I don't know about you, but if I'm on a conference call and I'm supposed to be looking at something, it's very easy for me to get distracted to looking at another computer, a Blackberry. And so being face to face, looking at this registry might be a very good thing. The other thing we asked for was the opportunity to create a steering committee or to recreate. Dr. Stewart and Eric and several were on that before. I think Mary was on it before. And so what we'd like to see is people from this committee as well as the other committee chairs appoint somebody so that the EMS voice is heard, the EMS medical director's voice is heard, injury prevention's voice is heard, the pediatrics voice is heard, 
so that as we move forward with the registry, we really have tried to reach out to all the stakeholders that may be touching this registry and using it. And we all just have to recognize, and Dr. Stewart said this better than anybody, it's already, the plane has already left the runway. So, you know, you can take uh, a bomb and shoot it down. I don't think that's what we want. I'm not really good at parachutes. So the bottom line is we have to figure out how to support this. It is what it is, and it takes us to make it work. So I personally would like to see us all try to invest in being on the solution side. I know that that's sometimes difficult for some of us, and I'll take the lead in saying it's difficult for me, but we need to be part of the solution and not constantly stating what the problem is. So I just want to open it up and see if anybody in the audience wants to comment on that. You guys were pretty verbal last night. This is your chance. I think I only have one takeaway from this is that <clears throat> the one thing is in being on the solutions work group is that it never should have to get to this point and I think that the information has not flowed to the group and has flowed as freely from the state as it should. It never should have to get to a boiling point and it seems like the only thing we ever do is get to a boiling point. So I would hope that, that we can do some of these things and, and meet while we're up here but um, we've had one meeting since last May. We've had one meeting scheduled since last May. So, you know, we've been, we want to be engaged. We want to keep working. We've brought it this far. We'd like to, you know, deliver it. But um, I, I just think that we, we just really need to examine how we're doing this, how this communication flows from the state, and to make sure that we don't get to these boiling points again, because I think it comes from lack of information. You know, it's nice that you guys met, but the solutions work group should have heard that stuff a long time ago and should have been able to answer some of that. So that's the only comment I have. Anybody else want to make a comment? Okay, so we're going to move on. Thank you, Tammy. So the next issue is the RAC criteria. And so Wanda, I know that you guys from the RACs group have presented this to GTAC. Is there anything we need to be aware of as that is further developed? The one thing I want to add, and Jane and I talked about this, and I just want to throw it out for um, discussion, is that, you know, with the validation of the trauma registry data, the question is, is there an opportunity for the RACs to actually provide some type of peer uh, registry validation? And so I go back to the major trauma outcome study, and that peer review or that peer evaluation was that a trauma coordinator traveled to those host sites to validate with a certain number of records that the data extraction was correct and the injury scoring was correct. And if there were variances that were defined, then the question of whether or not that facility could, could, could participate or continue to participate in the major out, outcome study was identified. So that's the question is whether or not the RAC, and so a lot of people are like, well, I and the RAC don't have that manpower. So the thought is it never would be a member that's employed by the RAC, but you do have registry committees and trauma committees in your RAC. So the question is, is could you create an infrastructure so that you have that opportunity for that type of validation? So Jane, you want to comment on that? You know, this, this all stemmed from uh, conversations that started probably a year and a half ago with the registry on how to how to do some of the validation of the data with the new system it will do some self data validation but what we'd like to get to is we we all recognize that there are different levels of understanding as to who's going to do the entry of the data into the registry assuming that uh, the participants in the rack uh, would be willing to do this and go out and do some validation of what's been entered into that registry, whether it's at location or it's or it's brought to the rack in a 
PR type uh, venue, it would give us the opportunity to go back and say to the uh, CEO that if they're not being able to get in accurate information, then, then we, and when I say we, I mean the state, could say, Mr. CEO, you need to train your registrar because this is, this is what is expected. You're expected to have, I don't know, X percent of accurately entered uh, records, and this is where you are. So we could do, uh, look at opportunities to train in that area. It might be that it's by rack, it might be that it's uh, by region, it might be that it's by, that it's at TTCF, it might be that it's at a GTAC meeting, it might be, it would give us the, I guess the floor to talk to the CEO and say, this is what we expect in the system and in order for you to perform that and to meet those requirements, your staff has to be trained. That's where we would like to go. Comments from the group? Well, what if your staff is trained and they're just not doing a very good job because they don't have exposure to it? What is the discussion with the CEO? <coughs> well, and that's, and Mary, that's going to, going to happen and that has to be a discussion really with the facility and say, is it because, uh, you know, if you do something once every six months, your proficiency level is not as good as if you do it once a week. So that would be a discussion that would have to be had. And, and it, if you only have 20 patients a year, it's going to be hard to keep your proficiency level up. But if you have 200 patients a year or 500 <laughs> patients a year, there should be that level of expertise that comes along with that. Uh, and that's where we would be looking to have some of those discussions. Are there any HIPAA considerations with somebody from another facility coming in and going through your records? So if I invited, say, somebody from Jory's facility to come down and validate my records, what are the HIPAA implications of that? They'd have to be some sort of arrangement. If it was through a PI form, a PI process, um, I mean, there are ways to work that. And can we do self-validation if you have multiple registrars in your institution where they'll validate each other's work? Is that considered acceptable and, and reportable as, you know, we've done it and there was 90% concurrence between, you know, two registrars? I don't know. Would it be? I, I, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. I'm just asking the questions. I think for the hospitals that have multiple registrars, there's probably a pretty strong process in that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the idea on the discussion started how do you support those level threes and level fours where, you know, maybe somebody's gone through the training but they don't get to do it that often. How do you create that support system? So, again, this was just a thought that was brought up. Jane asked me about it and I'll put it on the agenda so we could begin to bring it up and discuss it. So, um, these are some of the recommendations. I'm going to skip because I know we're supposed to be through at 530, right? So we're yes. pretty close. So I'd like to ask Miss Sally Snow. Miss Sally, there's some issues going on with TNCC everybody in this room needs to know about, right? Um, we were just informed, we the course directors are actually the state trauma and pediatric chairs were just informed that the um, ANCC has decided that, which is the um, Academy or American Nursing Credentialing. Yeah, those people that provide CE. Um, they have decided that if a course has not been revised and now has 50% new content, they will not allow ENA specifically to award CE, which means that the, all the re-verification courses for TNCC and ENPC will not be allowed to give CE anymore. Those were seven and a half hour re-verification courses and they're not going to be giving CE for those. So, the ENA board made a decision that nurses go to courses like that for CE, and so they're not gonna do them anymore. Effective December 31st, the board's made a decision that there will be no more re-verification courses. So you guys that are used to putting your nurses through re-verification courses for TNCC will not be able to do that after December 31st unless <coughs> something changes. There's, there was a lot of dissension um, on the conference call, we all said, you know, um, that's not the case. They go for a card. 
They go because they're required to be verified providers and really don't care so much about the, the, the CE. And the hospital certainly doesn't care about the nurse's CE. They care about all their nurses being verified TNCC providers. So this is, the, this is what we've been told as of now. It may change, but you, you guys need to know that if you want to do re-verification courses, you're going to have to do them before December 31st. And ENPC rollout, the new fourth edition ENPC is coming. There will be no re-verification course coming out at all for that course. So if it changes, I'll try to, to get that information out. But right now, it's as of December 31st, there will be no more re-verification. Thank you, Sally. Christina Reeves, can you stand up? So I just want to recognize their rack for doing the um, shattered dreams of the water, shall we say. So if you didn't have a chance to go by today, <laughs> it was extremely impressive, made me cry. Um, so you're to be commended, and I think that's something that if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to, to ask Christine to look at that. And perhaps next Trauma Systems Committee, we can get you to debrief it, show that. Um, Dinah, Brenda, you have something from TTAF you want to bring up? Are they in the room? Okay. We're kind of out of time, so. Jory, yes. can I have one minute? Yes. Uh, at the TTCF meeting yesterday, annually that group, if uh, they do an assessment to see if there's somebody that, earned, that deserves a lifetime achievement award, uh, typically the thumbnail version of that is somebody that's been actively involved in Texas trauma and is no longer. Um, at the strategic planning meeting uh, this year, an individual came to the surface and the, the short history of that individual is they were in the trauma registry business at a large institution and um, left Texas about 18 months ago, two years ago, I guess, something like that to um, take a national job involved uh, involving the National Trauma Data Bank. And I just wanted to publicly announce that Tammy Morgan received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Texas Trauma Coordinators. Well, she's not here, but I know she'd say thank you. Um, one other thing I just want to point out is we did have poster presentations today. And then the um, rack displays. And everybody go by. Raise your hand if you went through that process. So here's the question. You want to repeat it again? So what we, several people in the room talk, thought, talked about was doing it every May, because May is National Trauma Awareness Month. So does that sound like something you guys would be interested in? So start thinking about what you want to do next year. So we're really going to target RACs, the affiliated associations, and any poster that you presented from May of 2013 back um, you're eligible to bring that poster and sharing of information. So I know Galen was here. I want to recognize her. She saw it. She had several there. Lawan had several there. Who else? Mary Frost. So thank you very much for your participation. Any, we have an action item that we have to... Craig Daniels' recommendations for the physicians for um, the board certificate, the liaisons. We need to take a vote on that and approve it. So is there a motion? I move we accept it as presented. Is there a second? Dr. Lopez? Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say aye. No other questions, we're adjourned. <laughs>